Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Writers Chat. And this is the place where writers like to gather. We talk about all things writing for writers and by writers. And we're so glad you're with us today. Welcome, welcome. If you're here in our chat, we got a lot of our regulars over there. And or if you're taking the time to watch the replay, we always say that because we know there's a group of you that are part of our community that take the time to watch this each week. And we really, really appreciate that. So welcome to Writer's Chat. My name is Jean Wise. I'm one of the co-hosts here. And I have some of our behind the scene crews that I asked to stay on today. We have Norma and Jan and Melissa, and we asked them to stay on for some of the discussion today for what we're gonna do. And we like to periodically have book discussions, don't we gals? We like to feature different books, especially writer books, and talk about, talk about them. So today I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about one, it's called Writing Life Stories, and the author is, let's see if I can get that just right. Ah, it's always backwards, Bill Rohrbach. There you go. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, a little bit about the book, and where I think it might be useful for us as writers. And then we're going to do, he's got a lot of writing exercises. So we're going to have a discussion, at least among us on camera right now on that. So those of you that are in the chat, your job is to think about how you might answer some of the questions we're going to talk about, either share in the chat or be willing to jump on, because we may bring you guys back on a little bit early, depending on how we're doing on time, for just some discussion on, on that. So uh, anything else, gals, before we get started? Thanks. All right. all right, we'll get started then on that. Right to the, I, you know, sometimes I don't like all the chit, 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 chat. So anyway, we'll get right to it. So writing life stories by Bill Rohrbach. This was originally published in 2008. And what I'm holding is the 10th, 10 year update. So in 2018, he went through and updated it and gave some new illustrations. And so you, there's some older versions out there. And the, today I'm gonna to refer to the newer one. So it is kind of an old new book. I always say that says something about the quality of a book that has mm -hmm. stayed around for 10 years and then they've taken the time to update it. And it says something also about the author. He has stayed in it. We've talked about how sometimes we just have to show up and, as writers and stay in this stuff. But, who is, had you ever heard of Bill Rohrbach before? Any of you guys? No. I have there. He was, he was a new one for me. It would not have been one like uh, an Anne Lamont that I would know on a writer's <laughs> book. Or a writer's book. So he was new. So I found a little bit more about him and I'm going to share a little bit about it. He was born in 1953 in Chicago. He is, his tagline is basically he's a novelist, a short story, a nature writer, a memorist, <laughs> A, a journalist, a blogger, and a critic. Well, that's a lot of hats as a writer, isn't it? Yeah. You hear he's written both fiction and nonfiction, and he has won a ton of awards for in both areas. That kind of impressed me on that way. He, his fiction writer, then called Big Ben, won the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction and an O. Henry Prize. Those are pretty big prizes in the fiction area. His memoir, which, which was in all about nature, is called Temple Stream, won the Maine Literary Award for Nonfiction. His novel, Life Among Giants, won the Maine Literary Award for Fiction. And also a novel called Remedy for Love was one of the six finalists for the Kirkus Fiction Award. And he's currently writing a new novel right now. So it, 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 it look up. I uh, uh, searched him out a little bit, so I was trying to find something current, but he is under contract to write a new novel right now. So you heard some things on Maine. He is lives up in Maine now, and he's quite a naturalist up there. And so he is well-known, probably more in the New England. I don't know who's from New England in our group, Bob. Sherry Lynn is from New England, but I don't see her here today. I don't know if anybody, so people up maybe in that area know him more as a, columnist or a journalist. So that's sort of his background on that. He's written tons of articles. Listen to some of the magazines he's written. Harper's, Atlantic Monthly, News, New York Times Magazine, uh, and are you ready for this? Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, th this book is not Christian, we'll tell you that, but it's not, I don't, 
did you looked at it, Norma? You said you looked at it or did you read it? It's it's not non-Christian either, I would say. Not at all. You know, I was I didn't find anything offensive. Did you? No. I didn't read read it word for word. I checked it out of the library and kind of skimmed through each chapter, but I didn't find anything. It to me, he's um how how would you say it? He I wouldn't categorize him as either. He's just oh. Middle of the road. Middle of the road. Uh, I didn't. I didn't find anything offensive. I didn't find it offensive. It's kind of. Um, he's this book is. Yeah, I was going to say this in a minute. This book is used in a lot of college level as resources for uh, writing professors. They use it for uh, to help get ideas and pr present. And I'll t tell you something more with some of the stuff in it. And as you hear some of the categories and some of the questions we discuss, you'll get that flavor. So it, it, especially if you taught anything uh, with, um, sorry, give me a call. That's embarrassing. There you go. If you taught anything um, uh, writing wise, or you teach on that level, this might be a good reference for you that, in, on, in that way. I found his Twitter account. And you know how we talked last week about the bios? I thought this was an interesting and thought-provoking thing he put on his bio, that he is a good writer with bad habits. I like that. <laughs> yeah. It kind of said, yeah, I think we can identify with that, can't we? I saw an interview by him he, it, where somebody asked him about that. And he said, I used to be more orderly. But with a kid in the mix and book tours and every other thing life throws at me this day, it's hard for me to keep my old schedule of every morning, no matter what's going on. So now I catch blocks of time whenever and whenever I can. I drop my daughter off at ballet and go to the library across the street. I write for an hour before the dentist appointment. I bring the laptop along keep going, keep writing in the waiting room. I write on airplanes, lots of airplanes. I write late, late at night when everybody's asleep. I write for five minutes whenever I can. I let the bits add up and come bust. I thought that was a good word. As for bad habits, I like to play in the band, but all those late nights and early mornings <laughs> hit my writing on that way. And his advice to writers, if you're gonna be a writer, be a writer, that is write. Do it every day. So there's kind of an essence of who he is. He sounds like a real writer to me, doesn't he? Sound like a real writer mm -hmm. to you guys? Yeah. He does. Yeah, I think so. Elaine had the question and she thought he was uh, a college professor, I think was what she he did. asked. Yeah, he taught at the Ohio State University. And <laughs> I know he taught at, you got to say that when you're from Ohio. And he taught at a couple other places, but I don't. I don't know if I can pull those up real quick where you top, but she is right on that. Exactly right. Uh, let's see if it's it, 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 from his bios. He sounds like a, a really neat, uh, neat writer. I mean, he's, he doesn't, uh -huh. as, as people that are fairly new to it, to writing or haven't quite been published to hear somebody sound not so polished and perfect makes the, the new, newer person or unpublished person feel like, I can do this too. Yeah, I think so too. I think exactly that way. And he, he's, like I said, a, authentic. There's an uh, authenticity to, to his bio that way. So that's who Bill Warbach is. And I think if you want to summarize the essence of this book altogether, it's in the tagline. And I'm going to read the tagline to you underneath there. And it says, how to make memories into memoirs ideas into essays, and life into literature. And I think the essence of what he says in a lot of his exercises and activities here is that stories are all around us. And it's our job as writers to observe them and capture them and use them. And we had that illustration last week. And help me remember, gals, when she talked last week, she she was what an occupational therapist was that her background Do you guys remember was she uh, and there was a patient she was working with who talked to her about her his grandma's experiences in old florida wasn't that right yeah. right wasn't that it and how she took that and took what were they letters i can't remember if they were letters i think so i think so too and she then expanded it and then fictionalized the story with their approval 
Mm-hmm. She did add that later on, but it, it, there are stories all around us. It made me think of a quote, and I looked it up in my journal this morning because I journaled it in January, and it's by Susan Son- Sontag, who says, a writer is someone who pays attention to the world. A writer is a professional observer. I'm often asked if there's something I think writers ought to do, and I say this. There's several things. You love words, agonize over sentences, but most important, pay attention to the world. So I think that's sort of the essence behind his book here, to pay attention. Do you guys see that in observing? Yeah. Yeah, on that on that way. So there's stories all around us. And so that's sort of kind of like the first question is where do we see that's one I probably didn't send you guys is where do we see stories all around us on stuff and I started thinking about that this morning it's bits and pieces of conversation like what we learned last week her story about old Florida but sometimes just Facebook memes or an email Mm -hmm. I got an email from my cohort that I work with today who sent me an article and I should have written it down here and she said boy this really nails what we're feeling in fatigue fear and floundering and I go oh those are three great f words sorry for that but I thought (laughs) oh wait a minute that would be a great blog post but I would also add that you need faith and forgiveness or you know I was I was really going I went about 15 minutes just really went off on that email that she sent for something totally other different has become probably next week's blog post already you know so it's scribbled here on a little sticky note <laughs> to be used later but where do you guys see stories around you do you guys see some stories around you all the time where do you see some some places that you see stories watching the grandkids <laughs> <laughs> can you give an example at all of that jan just the way they help each other yeah the three oldest are only a year apart and they're always helping the two younger it's like especially the baby her sisters when we, they get together or it's like I'm watching them and they're always bringing toys to her to play with. So she's not just sitting there by herself. So it's like you could take off on a story for kids Mm -hmm. on how to help each other. And, you know, or it could be a nonfiction article or it could be an article, you know, there's so much Norma, Melissa, you got an example that you could think of. One of the things that I've thought of often, it's kind of weird, but It's me. So there you go. (laughs) Uh, We live close to a cemetery. And often when my daughter was going to the community college, I'd see a blue tent and I'd say, look, there's a new dead person. And it would just, mystery is my thing. I like mystery. I like romantic suspense. Um, And I told her, so one of these days, I'm going to write a story about under the blue tent. Ooh, what a title. Um, just haven't done it yet, but that's always, you know, mm-hmm. back there brewing. So one of these days mm-hmm. I'll get to it. Oh, I like that. That is good. That is good. Melissa, you got an idea? That reminded me of another idea. Actually, I had two going. <laughs> the, 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 back in, in youth group days, we actually would take the kids up to the cemeteries and have them each explore the headstones and read the epitaphs and things like that and that you've got you've got them thinking about mortality but it also got them thinking about the lives that those people led and some of those places even had like you know plaques that told a little bit about them the more well-to-do older um residents of our community and and so yeah it's you it's so uh open i eye-opening to walk through a cemetery and just look at all of the the memorials put up um, It'd be a great Halloween activity. <laughs> yeah. I like what, I'm sorry, are you finished, Melissa? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, I, I can wait on mine, and if you're springboard enough, we, we just talked about. Um, no, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to talk about people watching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I Charlie am, says that in the chat. He says yeah. he remembers an older man in her. Yeah in his hometown who would often be seen in a restaurant in a suit, taking a seat near other occupied 
tables. He appeared to be eavesdropping and taking notes. My mom wondered if he was going to write a book and I wanted to see what he'd do. And we've talked about just doing that to learn how to write good dialogue, realistic dialogue is to write down conversations. And Sally mm -hmm. shared her pastor sermons actually can be great. That's true. <laughs> true. Exactly. People watching, people walking, people, just everything, just everything with people. So observe, I got an email from uh, uh, somebody I hadn't seen for, well, pre-pandemic. And she shared with me that the, being in the pandemic has made her decide to go back and get her master's in Christian counseling of all things and she shared that way and this was the line she said she said she's been told she was too old but the pandemic struck and it laid her bare and she decided it was time to pursue a dream oh my gosh that could be non-fiction it could be fiction you could just can't you see that so watch and that that's sort of what he says and it's gonna be some of the examples we're going to talk about today is just pay attention if that take any way anything away from today Observe, observe, observe on, on that. That's our, our writer's thing on that. Um, the table of contents, so you get an overview of the book. I just want to read you some of the title. It's got, of course, it's got an intro and all that, but it has, it, these are these 11 chapters. I'm just going to read the title so you get the uh, taste of it. Getting Started, Memory, and we're going to talk a little bit about memories, Scene Making, Big Ideas, Characters and Character, plural and singular, Stage presence, and we'll come back to that one here in a minute, what that means. Finding the facts, that's kind of the research. Metaphor and meaning, say it right. Building a building, and that's kind of like the framework, the three acts that you have to put together and all that. And uh, getting published. And the getting published thing is pretty short and dry, FYI. You know, it's, it, it was a lot what we need to know. But the strength in each of this book is the exercises, I would say, on that way. Norma, you looked at it. Would you kind of agree with that? Is the, he's, he's got five, four, eight of them in each chapter. So you can see it's a wealth of exercises. So if you were looking for something, for, like I said, a writer's uh, place you're going to present any sort of writer's skill or teach a class, this could be a good resource for you. Um, I'm going to read what he says about these exercises, though, because he firmly believes you should do every exercise in this book. Don't just pick and choose. Just pick what you want to do. What? And this is what he says. To be taught, one must be willing to learn. One must be willing to change, sometimes in fundamental ways, because to learn is to change. A writer who really wants to make the next step to grow must learn to have compassion for herself as a writer and a learner, must give up the idea she has already arrived, and must give up the idea that he already knows what to do. He says a little bit later, these exercises are meant to discover mounds of juicy material that are inside you. They are meant to give you practice they're meant for you to develop and then further develop your critical eye, but they're also meant to challenge the ways you already write, the ways you already find materials, the ways you're kind of settled into a rut. And if you're reading this far, you know, you, you know that you could produce greater results. So I thought that was hmm. just kind of stimulating. So he says, time to get to work and do the exercises elaine made the comment that she thought the exercises were really really good and some of them are hard we're going to talk about some of them but i'm going to start off with a pretty easy one that, that this is one i assigned these gals ahead of time on that in, in the getting started chapter the very first chapter the very very first exercise is whoop i jumped ahead is called a clean well lighted place he says, this of course comes uh, um, in a series of lectures and a subsequent book by Virginia Woolf. It's called A Room of One's Own. It was published in 1929. Virginia Woolf points out the unhappy fact that women, and sorry to the guys in the room, but he, she's right that this one's kind of oriented more to women, but I think it's true for all of us, often didn't or don't have a place where they might get some thinking or work of their own done away from the duties of parenthood, motherhood, housekeeping. Plus, 
now today of all full-time employment, elder care, late life, grad, late life graduate degrees, cell phones, and email accounts. That you need a room apart or a place apart to designate writing. So I want to know, you three, where do you write? What to describe the place where you write a little bit and what kind of elements do you have in there that supports your writing? Well, I uh, work at a armoire desk it's, and it's uh, so packed full of books that I can't even close the armoire. <laughs> <laughs> the computer. And then I have also my old typewriter next to me so that there's no, this thing's open and, and everybody gets to see it in all its cluttered glory. <laughs> And I usually have to have it quiet unless I get into the zone. Since I have a little bit of an ADD thing going on, I have to have absolute focus and silence to get into the mode because I'm easily distracted by all sorts of things. And I need to have everything there at my desk if I can help it. Because if I get up, there's a chance I'm going to get distracted by something and then not get back to what I need to do. But consequently, on the adverse or reverse side, and I think that... Um, uh, Tina mentioned this at one of our previous writers chats that the, those who have ADD can also get hyper focused. So if I get into the zone, then I almost exclude everything else and can't hear what's going on around me and shut the world out. So, That's a great observation as a writer. That really is. Do you have you ever tried headphones to block off the sounds? I'm not sure if I like them. Yeah, they, they would distract me because I, I don't like having things pressed on my face, I, even my hair. Normally, I keep it clipped up because I can't stand to have hair in my face. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sitting there. Blowing yeah. Out. <laughs> well, it work. Ah, oh, that sounds good. And is, and is it the, the room you're at right now is your writer's room? Yeah, originally this was our classroom back in the day when I homeschooled my kids. And so we still call it the classroom, even though it's kind of just an extension of our living room and my office space. Because we're, so, we're talking, Charlie's mentioned, and we're looking at your hatchets back there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I got my Viking war axes on the wall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is great. Inspiration plus a system, it sounds like you got. Yeah. Norma, what do you got? Where do you write? My oldest daughter moved out several years, a few years back, and about a year and a half ago, I converted her room to my office. Mm -hmm. And I have a nice big um, corner desk that's got all the shelves, and so I've got everything nice and sprawled out, and I've got writing resources on one side and dictionaries over the other side, and of course, um, my husband always says, calls me, have a drink, we'll travel. So I always have to have a beverage with me. So I've got my little coaster sitting right there. And I don't know what I did with my beverage now that I said that. <laughs> anyway, it's over there. But um, the only thing that's hard is sometimes my Wi-Fi is a little sketchy back there um, because I'm so far from where the, the unit is. So mm -hmm. today I'm in my, in my dining room. But I like it there. I can close the door, turn on a fan for, as, for noise, and I'm good. Oh, that's great. That's great. What helps you most there? Do you think it's the quiet or is it? The quiet um, and just that I can sit in this. I, I debated about having this ginormous corner desk because it's got these shelves that go way up and all this stuff, but it really helps me. I'm like Melissa, I tend to be eight kind of ADD and distracted very easily. And it helps sitting there at the desk with all of that in front of me is just helps me stay more focused. Yeah. Often I thought I'd like to be in front of a window, but I don't think a window would be a very wise choice for me because I love nature and birds and I do. Hmm, I, I need to have my nose in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great observation. That's great. Jan, what about you? Are you in your writing space right now? Yeah. I yeah, wondered that. With this new house in St. Cloud, Florida, we have four bedrooms. So I get to have my own space finally. This is the first time I've ever had a whole room for myself. Um, usually I write in the office. Every once in a while I'll write out back on, and look out at our pond. You know, if I'm stuck, it's like I can look there and mm -hmm. Um, the, my, I have two desks in my office. Um, they were both my dad's. 
Um, one was a, his childhood. It's a little roll top desk. And uh, usually my computer sits on that and it have my paperwork and stuff on the other desk, which was his high school desk. Um, and then I have my sewing machine and an antique wicker love seat, which I like to sit on. And sometimes I forget what I'm supposed to be doing and dream about where it originally was from up at the cottage in northern Michigan, looking out at the lake and mm -hmm. stuff. So sometimes I have to reel myself back in. And, um, the daydreaming is an important part of writing, right? True, it is. And I usually have the local Christian station on. Uh -huh. It's mostly music, very little talk. So it's playing in the background and it blocks out anything else that's going on in the house. So I, I you know, and I used to do that when I was studying in, in school too, because I'd always want to hear what the family was saying. So it, it helped to have music on to kind of drown them out. So I'd stay focused. And you got to know whether you need silence or whether you can have background music. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, there's two camps on that, isn't there? But you've got to know what best works for you mm -hmm. and create that environment and stuff. And I love how each of you have personalized it and done something. And Jamie, you mentioned like the, the creativity side of it. You know that I think that is great on that. I'm in my office, as you could tell. So I have tons, too many books here. And a lot of the writing books like Norma right here on, on the side. So they're within easy reach. I can reach my thesaurus is the thing I use almost more than anything. And that's right there. But I was actually, and I do like a window. My computer used to face this way, away from the window, and I have purposely now moved it here. So I do like looking at the window. That's my daydreaming, Jan. I uh, so I need the window. This is the only room in the house that's private with this kind of window, the, where it's a ranch. So the rest mm -hmm. of it have those high, narrow ones. Oh, okay. and, and so it's not good lighting in this other spare bedroom. So this is just a small den that I kind of converted and stuff and um it, it's neat that way but i was looking this morning and i decided i was fascinated melissa used the word clutter i do keep piles of projects and i decided this morning says i got too much clutter so <laughs> i think this fall i'm going to get rid of some of my piles and have to get more organized or something it's just too much and that's distracting me so i think you got to take and look at your space he used the thing about having a well-lit separate space. We've had some good comments in the, we have a bunch of INFJs. I'm going to add, I know there's only 2% of the world. I'm one too, Leslie. So uh, if you're on the Myers-Briggs in that way, Leslie says she, as an INFJ, she absorbs everything around her with her hubby and a son home. I haven't been able to write at all. That is difficult right now during the pandemic, especially because uh, routines have changed and stuff. I, I agree with you. Or some of you are, or having school from home, which you never had before until the pandemic hit, you know. But she's been going into her bedroom, but I'm going to redo her craft room. It's the smallest room in the house and packed full of supplies. I think that's, and, and she mentioned somebody that got a she shed just because she was having the same problem. <laughs> Wouldn't that be neat to have one of those writing cabinets in our backyard? Ah, I'd love that. Yeah. But I think that's the thing of it is, is his stress is it, it, like it's numbers. One, one exercise is if you don't have a space of your own or if it's changed because of the pandemic or whatever, try to create one, try to find one. Now, Bethany's not here today, but she's been redoing her office. We see her office every week and she's been redoing it if you follow her on Instagram on that way. Uh, Elaine says she's got, they've, moved and uh, they have a small bedroom as their office. It's taking, them, taking her a while to find the perfect arrangement. That is a great lesson, Elaine. You know, that you, you have to redo it like I had to move my computer. And Norma, I'll say to you, when we redid, we changed our router. So my router is sitting right here, right now, because I said, hey, I want the, I want the best internet. <laughs> so we moved the router to where I was. So anyway. On that way, we had a Nor Norma's an INFJ. Boy, we that says something about writer's chat, doesn't it? Wow.
So anyway, that's that's one of your assignments. And think about that too if you're in the chat, if you want to share something else about your writing space or how it's changed over the years or something that's really helped you. So thanks, gals, for sharing that. And I want to move on to the second chapter. I want to highlight the second chapter, which is one of the exercises in there on map making. And I thought this was intriguing to me. And this is what he has to do. Oops, I jumped to it. He says, um, make an actual map on a piece of paper. This is his assignment of a, the neighborhood you grew up in. And can you think how that would start bringing out stories and memories? You know, remember his tagline is how to make memories in the memoirs. Can you see the details if you had to? We lived in a house uh, till up to sixth grade. And I remember a couple years ago, I started thinking, what did the inside of that house look like? I was there from age three to about 11. And I started thinking through and I almost, I really had to get quiet and picture each room and all sorts of memories from those rooms came back to me and you know it took a while to remember where was the staircase wait a minute there's a house with two staircases and i totally forgot that there was a little little one in the kitchen that went up to one of the back bedrooms i thought oh, wouldn't that be a neat thing to have as a scene in a uh, in a uh, in a story but anyway so do you guys have something to share from like where did you grow up and it can't, not, may not be where you actually was born or where you spent part of your childhood that would make a good map or something about that do you got something jan let's start with you this time do you have something i grew up in a nice quiet street in detroit michigan um grade school was only a block away i think church was about eight blocks so if i wanted to i could walk to different classes or something. Um, it was, um, I could write a story about summer on Piedmont Avenue, um, all the different kids riding our bikes, the parties. We had a party out on our, we had a big back porch and my dad and my cousin carried the organ from the room that was the dining room was right there and there was a, the door was there carried it out to the back on the porch an organ wow yeah and so my cousin and my dad were playing and we were all singing and dancing out in the backyard we had you know friends and ki the kids friends the adult friends and it was really fun I, it's like i could take off on a lot of things that we did there that could be quite a scene or quite a setting mm -hmm. for, for characters to do something, whether it's a children's book or an adult book or even an illustration of a nonfiction, wouldn't it? Yeah, but then we got in trouble and had to take the organ inside. Somebody complained. <laughs> in the neighborhood. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the, the police walked back and said, I'm sorry, somebody wants you to quiet down. <laughs> it was getting later in the evening, so we did. <laughs> Organ music? Oh my gosh, that is so, that'd be fun. That'd be a fun thing to put in the book. <laughs> Norma, you got a memory? I do. Um, <clears throat> although Jan just triggered another one, but uh, ah. at the time uh, when I was going over this, I grew up in Miami, Florida. Wouldn't want to live there today, but I grew up, that's where I grew up, and it was a great place to live. And especially in the summertime, we would play block tag. There's all of us kids, we would play tag. It's kind of a cross between hide and seek and tag, covering the whole block. And you could only hide behind something. Um, you couldn't go in anybody's house. You couldn't go in a shed unless the shed was open. Um, and we would play it for obviously hours and hours because it would take a while to find somebody. And there would probably be 15, 20 of us kids playing. Um, it was a lot of fun. And we'd play till the street lights came on. on and then we all scattered and boogied home because that was the rule in the summertime. Be home when the street lights on. Yeah, yeah I can remember that rule too. too. Yeah. On that. Wow. That is a great, great memory. And some friendships developed out of that too. You can see how that could go off on a lot of different reasons. I have to break here real quick. Charlie's... No, Brett said that, that his grandma and grandpa's farmhouse in the mountains of West Virginia. And that made me think, we mentioned the, um, 
uh, the, the novel last year, Christy, which was Catherine Marshall's grandmother's story and house in the mountains, you know? And so see where the stories come like that? It's, and it's just amazing. Melissa, what do you have? Um, well, I still live, well, I don't live where I used to live, obviously. I still live in the general vicinity. I was uh, raised in Newcastle, outside of Newcastle, Wyoming. But I was eight miles out of town, the opposite end of, of town. And we we're um, on the border of the Black Hills, Wyoming, mm-hmm. South Dakota. And so just gorgeous pine forests all over. And our our little rural um neighborhood was hidden up in the hills you couldn't see it from the highway so it always felt like a world apart you know that <laughs> nobody knew that we existed and we lived on a road called breakneck road which in the winter time what a great name oh i put that in a story in yeah. a hard- <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a nice book title yep it does. It does. It does. Breakneck road. <laughs> but oh. you know, my sister and I uh, we were both kind of the quiet, shy type, so we were oftentimes just outside playing. That was what we always did, and have vivid imagination. So we were making up stories. Felt like we we're in a fairy tale forest, and you know, couldn't see our neighbors unless we went traipsing through the woods to find their house. And so, uh-huh. I w- we had always had imaginary characters and things, and we're coming up with a story every single day. And just you know, we could always be found outside hunting for wild turkeys and things like that. Uh-huh. Don't talk to me about wild turkeys right now. It's a whole other story. I got attacked by them all week ago. But anyway, a little herd of them. That scared the daylights out of me. Anyway, they, uh, you mentioned the Black Hills. And, you know, there, there's history and stories all around us. Mm-hmm. I grew up in Canton, Ohio, which is a large metropolitan in northeast Ohio, large uh, home of the Football Hall of Fame. You may have heard of that. But anyway, Canton, um, and just FYI, for, this made me think about it. I had, had discovered a couple years ago a Facebook group that says growing up in, the wonderful thing about growing up in Canton, Ohio, or something, it's an odd thing, it's something about growing up in Canton, Ohio, and they put all these nostalgic pictures on. Remember this, remember this, and some of it's before my time, and some of it's after my time. But it is fun to follow, and it does bring back memories. He, they asked the question once, did you ever have your doctor make home visits when you were growing up? Mm-hmm. It must have had 400, 500 comments. You know, it was fascinating to read through and, on that. And uh, they just, it was just wonderful on that. And um, so there, there are all sorts of sources in the stories on that. He takes this map making. Did you have something, Melissa? I was going to say that there was a little more to it than, than you spurred it on to remind me is that we actually lived right near an old abandoned mining town um, <gasps> called Cambria. And uh, it, yeah, we actually rode our horses up through it on, on occasion because we knew that one of the people that owned part of the land that it sat on and so yeah you could go and you could see all the rundown houses and the abandoned mine they said that people left it so fast when newcastle came through the railroad came through and newcastle boomed up around it that they left pots on the stove tops oh. so the place was just utterly abandoned and uh, yeah. there's this old cemetery up there and everything it, it spurred my love of history at an early age yeah, but can you hear the sparks of ideas coming out just of the four of us talking these things? My daughter Valerie lived for a while in middle Pennsylvania, and, and this has been on the news. There is a town there that was abandoned over a coal mine that is on fire. Underneath the town, the coal mine's oh. on fire, and they had to abandon the town. And it's just, it's just like what you said. They, the houses are still there. Mm-hmm. and stuff and, and, and things but uh, it's just there are stories all around guys just keep looking for it he does take map making one step further in this chapter well he does it in several different ways but i did want to share his one trick he says now that you've made your map it's time to write here's the assignment tell us a story about your map and this is the lead he gives you one day back in and i would start one day back in canton ohio and i laugh Sophia I saw she said she liked to climb the trees and that's exactly 
what I did a lot. We had several wonderful trees that were perfect for climbing. So that's exactly where I went, Sophia. I thought one day back in Canton, Ohio, as I climbed the tree, the story tree, because it became stories for me on that. So can you guys think of a one day back in time in Detroit or Miami or outside of wherever you are right now in Wyoming, <laughs> Melissa, can you want to have one or two ideas to share real quick? Well, I remember one day when we went riding on horseback up in Cambria and my mom decided we'd stop and look at the old cemetery. And that was before it had been vandalized. And most of the graves are from um, mid to late 1800s. I think some might have gone up to the early 1900s. I can't remember because I was very young at the time. But what stood out to me the most was that a lot of them had the little glass oval still in there with the pictures of the person who had passed away in it. Really? And so I could see faces with the names and that just got my imagination going. Oh, it does. It does. Did Jan or Norma think of anything? Um, the thought that just popped into my mind was often, when, well, let me do it like the exercise says. One day back in Miami, mm -hmm. it was New Year's, <clears throat> at New Year's Eve, and my parents always threw a party and as kids were confined to the bedroom because adult beverages were being served mm -hmm. and they would dance and things like that. And we would open the door and peek through and watch them and see what they were doing and then laugh and make fun of them. Yeah. Can you see how <laughs> details like that though would bring a scene alive in a story? would yep. really would capture it and bring it alive because you lived it, you saw it. And that's why I think there's a power to this using our own memories in our own writing that way. Jan, did you have one one day back in Detroit? That um, Norma just reminded me of something similar. Um, huh? One day back in Detroit, mom and dad had parties frequently and we could stay up to see everybody because back then in the 50s, they dressed up to go to parties at homes. So we could, I'd do my mom's hair up in a French twist and she'd be, you know, all decked out. And so we got to say hi to everybody and then we then went to bed. Well, in my bedroom, I could lay on the end of the bed and listen through the air vent and I could hear the party going on down the basement. <laughs> so that was fun. Can you imagine, though, a character, what they could listen through the air vent, what they might hear or overhear or learn maybe something about themselves? They might learn they were adopted and they didn't know they were adopted, or they might have learned they had a brother that they didn't know about or something. I'm just... Yeah, you like, could come up with all kinds of stuff. Uh-huh. So, see, and that and I think it, it's a fun exercise that when you're stuck on a scene or a setting or a twist in the story. Now, I don't know how, Melissa, how you take this back to what 12th century, is it Scotland or Ireland? I can't remember where you are. Ireland. Yeah, and stuff. But I think there's gotta be elements of that that you could bring in no matter what year it is mm -hmm. on that. On, on that. Um, this is taking longer than I thought, which is good. I'm going to, because it's since we're big, talking about memories, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit and on uh, to an exercise on a later chapter. Um, I'm trying to see which chapter it is on characters. No, big ideas. It's got some great thing on big ideas about uh, seeing the big picture, about taking a sentence, we just took a sentence, like one day back in, he gives us another assignment on that. He just says, you take a piece of paper and on the top of the paper, you write the word on, and then you put a noun on that and think about something you have been thinking about uh, on sitting in the dark. These are some things I come on, on wrestling with God, on finding God even in the dark. Can you see how I was playing around with those words? You could do on success, on secrecy, on fear, on grief, on the eve of the pandemic. <laughs> you know? Wow. See, uh, think how just simply taking a sheet of paper, writing the word on at the top, and then just writing some different nouns, how that might spur an idea. 
And that's sort of list making, which he lists, he gives as an idea later on too. That says, he says, list five things that are making you happy right now or whatever emotion you're trying to evoke in the article or the story. What's affecting your life right now? What's affecting your emotions, you know? Uh, what's affecting what you're seeing on social media? And try to come up maybe with one word. What is uh, in each of those on that? So it keeps it narrowing and it would give you an idea for blog posts. I read an article just this morning on Edie's, um, Edie Melson's, uh, no, it was yesterday, on Edie Melson's webpage about a mini memoir moment, a the power of generating lists. And I thought, you know, that really is on that. And this is a couple of her examples. Uh, use lists to stir up memories. What, right? This is what was your first, your last, your best, or your worst, and make these like four columns and throw into them your first kiss, your last car, a job, a date, a meal, a day at school, dance. I'm not sure when the last time I danced, to be all honest. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Vacation. I'm not sure if we know what those are anymore under the pandemic. Family gathering, your first pet. Can you see how making a list? starts generate, generating ideas, or a time when, and that's sort of like a bit back what we did a minute ago. So list making can be powerful on that. And that, so I kind of threw that one in, but that was part of his make a list on that. And I just thought that idea of almost trying to think of an essay where you would write on whatever, on being, uh, what do you call the hatchets behind you? They're biking war axes. Yeah. War axes. Okay. On uh, finding a war axe <laughs> at my local antique store. I don't. I'm just making that one up. <laughs> yeah. But what emotions can you? Can, do you guys? Does that sound like something any of you guys would use? Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that. Okay. On that. And the uh, one one other thing I do want to, because we're getting about 10 minutes here, so I, I do want to bring everybody back on real quick, is is uh, he, there is a chapter on voice, and we're going to talk about voice. I'm not sure exactly when. Do you know when we're doing that? October. October. We're going to talk about October. I thought this was an intriguing idea that I never had thought before about discovering your own voice. And this is in what the chapter he calls stage presence, which I thought was an interesting way to think about voice. But anyway, this is his assignment. And then he turns around and he opens, expands on it and another excitement. And I'll read you the two. He says, write a letter to someone you haven't seen for a long time, explaining yourself. It should not be a letter you intend to really just send, but the person may be dead or alive. He said, go ahead and just write it. And then the exercise two, you go back to the letter. Okay, you cut off all the small talk. Most letters have some of that. What's left? Read the remaining paragraphs out loud. It's sort of an essay. What is the issue that you chose to write about? What's the dramatic center? Why did you pick that person to write to? And this is actually is a voice exercise. What you're reading your letter out loud, you notice how powerful your voice is and what your real writing voice is. It. Had you guys ever thought about doing something like that? I've never thought about on that. And you know, it would be a safe letter to write if you weren't going to write it. It's kind of like when you talk to that stranger on the bus and you share things with a stranger that you wouldn't share with your best friend. You think, gee, I can't believe I told him all this. You know, it's that sort of thing. What is that issue? It, read it out loud and you might find your actual voice and on on that i want to read you an example of one that he had in his class whoops can't find okay and apparently she wrote this this was a graduate student at ohio at the ohio state and she said he she he wrote to a child and this it explained about the night his dad died i thought this was interesting 
The night your dad died, Jim came for us and took us to the hospital, took us to hospice. He walked with you hand in hand back to where your father lay and watched you climb on the bed and felt you kiss him on his cold brow. He was so white, you remarked. Psychologists said the children of three do not understand death, its finality, its various aspect, aspects, but I know you did even then. One night after the visit, during which he tried to explain what was happening, you cried hysterically for nearly an hour. I couldn't comfort you. The night of your father's death, Jim recalled that at the memorial service, you asked to return by yourself. And Jim and you once again made the trip down the long hallway. He waited at the door. You scrambled up on the bed again. You kissed your dad one more time and said goodbye. Jim, who rarely cries, did cry at that retelling. When you're older, I have a vintage bottle of red wine to give you. It's very expensive. Your father bought it in honor of your birth. It's wrapped in yellowing newspaper containing an article about when, when he was working at a trial, he was a lawyer in Cleveland, and he raced home to see you newly born. What wonderful gifts you and I have been given. Isn't that just, can you see, hear her voice? And mm -hmm. she talked about something past and something present and actually something future in that and incorporated all that. And her voice came out. If she ever questions what her voice is, there you can hear her saying that. Oh, I, I've never seen that in, in, in discovering my own voice on that, on that way. Have any of you guys have a hint on discovering your own voice at all to share? The only thing I know is when I've had um, some of my writer friends that Melissa and I are, and Rachel were a group and, and together, uh, I've been told that something I've written that I've asked them to critique was not my voice, but exactly what that meant. I don't know. I'm still discovering that. <laughs> I think it's, he does stress. It's a lifelong pro uh, process mm -hmm. too. <laughs> but with that, your readers know when it's not you. Mm -hmm. so that's why it's good to have people to uh, critique partners. I think mm -hmm. so. I think that, and then they know, I know blogging has helped me find my voice on that. And I think it's the repetitiveness of writing every week that has done it. And I know when I hit that little publish button, I know if it's real or not, or if it's more report, I call it reporting. Sometimes I feel like I just report or share something. And other times it's just raw me. And that raw me is the voice. Uh, side of, side on that. El Elaine says he's, he's that he thought that she thought that first exercise was vague, but she went with it without reading ahead, and it was really telling. So you see, I think that that is something that we can take and and do. I was trying to find one last thing to share with you. Oh, this was about the part about getting published, and I think it's something we've talked about before. But I'll end with that one, then we'll invite everybody back in, and we'll tell everybody about next week, and we'll. See if anybody has, I skipped several things I was going to do. So you, know, you never know how much time you're going to have. Um, well, you do. <laughs> the, uh, the last thing he said to do was like go to a bookstore and open the books that are similar to yours, but read the thank yous and the acknowledgements on that. And I think sometimes we forget to do that. We look for all the ideas that are around it. When we read the acknowledgements and look at the appendix, we get a sense of where all this writer has been to, uh, it, it broadens our knowledge of that genre, of what's going on in that field. And I, th I don't know if you guys have ever done that. Have you gone through the bookstore and looked through like books? Mm -hmm. With books I've had. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Jan, okay. you've gone, probably kids books especially, haven't you? Yeah, I've gone to get ideas, and um, I think it's the Magic Tree House. I ended up buying one because that's the style I ended up writing in. There you go. But also look, like I said, at some of the front matter and back matter of these books. Mm -hmm. um, I just finished reading a book. It was just it was a secular book just last night called Well, where is it? Um, here it is. Disappear for a minute. The hot hand for people that like streaks and basketball. 
was just different. But he's very, he writes it in a very journalistic tone of voice. And what fascinated me and what I learned from him as a writer was the vast bibliography he had in the back. This guy really did his research and recorded it well. And I remember thinking that was what I learned from him as a writer. The book was interesting. You know, do, are, do basketball players really have streaks of shooting or not? Ah, it was interesting. But, and I'm not going to tell you the answer. But anyway, the, um, the background research he did, you know, was volumes of research sometimes for a story like this. So I think, Melissa, you've discovered that in some of the history stuff you've written, haven't you? Yeah, the, I don't even want to consider what word count that would add to my novel. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda, I don't know if she's in the chat. I haven't seen her today. Rhonda has, has said that too, that she has just learned and she's sharing it in social media, some interesting facts, if I remember right, history and stuff like that on, on that way. Well, let's invite everybody back on if you want to come back on and make your final comments. And um, if I don't know if we've put anybody in writer's chat jail, but you know, if we, if you can't get back on, you want to make a comment if you've read the book or something that you struck you, if you want to share and Melissa, while people coming back on, do you want to share a little bit about next week's, hi, Isabel, I didn't see you join us. Hi there. Yay. Um, about next week's writer's chat. Sure. We're going to go into part two of our um, fiction writing presentation. I don't know how many of you remember or were here for the last time that we talked about character the last time. So now we're going to go into discussions on plot and the structure of novels. And that's, that'll be what we cover, different kinds of okay. plot and structure. Yeah, that'll be great discussion. Great discussion on that way. Elaine, you read this book I'm seeing. I have read most of it. I'm not quite through with it yet, but yeah, it's, it's intense. I found it intense. I mean, yeah. it's not such knowledge and he's got millions of ideas that I would have never thought of and um, I think it's I think it must come from what I gathered is it comes from a lot of classroom um, you know being a professor and a lot of interaction with different writers at various levels <coughs> excuse me I thought it was very good. Yeah, it, 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 it's almost like you're sitting in a classroom, isn't it, on that? He'll refer to some students. He'll say, students didn't like this exercise, but I made them do it anyway. And you know, <laughs> I, I, and so he's speaking like a teacher in that way. So I think it'd be a good resource, especially, especially for teaching, if you're gonna teach anything like yes. that. I love it, Elaine, and you jumped right in some of those exercises, even, you know, I'd look at some of them, I think, well, that's different, you know. <laughs> Check out yeah. my book. Yeah, you got it marked up, see? We got it marked up, don't we? I've so. also got, um, I did an exercise. I put the, I tore it off my tablet ah. and put it, taped it to the exercise. That is wonderful. Well, I'm glad that it helped you along then, didn't it? Oh man, it was yeah. challenging. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have anything else to add as we wrap up? And then we'll have our after party. Well, I hope it gave you some food for thought today. And, and thank you for M Melissa and Jan and Norma for being part of us today. And we got, got some good points. And like I said, we, we like to do a periodic book review. So if you run across one, you think it would be a good discussion, you know, f feel free to suggest it to one of us and, uh, and stuff. We, we've done several of them over the years. And, uh, and so it's kind of fun to periodically pull something off the shelf and uh, look at it as writers. So we're glad to do that. So thank you for being with us today on this week's Writer's Chat. And we look forward to next week when we talk about fiction part two, two yes. one or part two, <laughs> 2 2.0. <laughs> we'll talk about fiction next week. So see you all next week, everybody. Bye now. Bye.